Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this um, all important day. And so I would like to start out with my first slide and I have no disclosures. Heartfit for Life is a unique cardiac rehab program that is not in a physician's office, nor is it a hospital-based program, but it is one of the first community-based programs in the nation that started in 1970. It is a nonprofit organization. The HeartFit for Life paradigm reaches all patients on the continuum of care, offering both online and on-site programming. You can attend after an acute event or years later if struggling with risk factors or new symptoms. Evidence suggests that just about anyone with a heart problem, new or chronic, or those at risk for one can benefit. Our community-based program allows you to enroll without being dictated by timing, event, or diagnosis. This is a unique feature to the program in that you can refer to the program without having an acute or recent event, as our program is not covered by insurance due to Medicare's rule requiring an MD to be present within three minutes of an emergency. Comprehensive cardiac rehab at HeartFit. We have the same standards like other cardiac rehab programs. HeartFit for Life is comprehensive and is medically supervised with the main difference of intermittent rhythm surveillance rather than ongoing telemetry. We have the capability to do a 12 lead EKG as needed. In the event of an emergency, our ACLS RNs utilize our code cart and call 911. Optional functional fitness testing adds another layer of outcome measurement for individuals, as well as great feedback to the patients. In addition to regular aerobic exercise and resistive training, we incorporate balance training in our classes. We provide a comprehensive education, we, sorry, we provide comprehensive education in a myriad of ways, both online, in person, individually, and in a group. Here are a few pictures of depicting our on-site program. Not only do we have a variety of equipment, including treadmills, recumbent bikes, ellipticals, but we also provide dance aerobics and drumming. COVID silver lining was an opportunity for us to pivot to online services that were so well received that it remains a viable and robust part of our program. Each new member has an initial evaluation, including a personal phone call and a group orientation on Zoom. The member chooses online, hybrid, or on-site classes. If online, an intro to Zoom class is done to assess self-monitoring skills, orient them to Zoom, experience a sample class, and use the channel app to enter their metrics. The channel app is used for all members, allowing for remote and on-site surveillance, and thus allowing us to become paperless. The channel app also provides an educational platform and a HIPAA-protected nurse-patient chat feature. Members have a variety of classes to choose from that are live stream classes led by fitness instructors. Each class speaks to different levels of ability from stand-up dance aerobics to chair aerobics, including balance, stretch, and strength exercises in each 45-minute class. Members check in early to talk with the RN to super, who supervises each class. The RN has access to each member's history through the channel dashboard. If a problem arises, the RN calls the member and an action plan is made. RN care managers meet regularly with their patients to assess, monitor, and evaluate their individual care plan and progress. The requirements are minimal to participate in the Zoom classes, a cleared four by four space, a chair without arms available, a cell phone handy, and a water bottle. UCSF and HeartFit for Life are the only programs offering online options in the Bay Area that I'm aware of. Our online program is no sorry, our online program is no longer just a stopgap, but truly a vital new service and has created new opportunities. 
Here are a few pictures depicting the user view and the nurse's gallery view. As you can see, we have a little fun every week with different themes and music. Here is a sample video of an online class. Hi everyone, HeartFit for Life offers in-person and online classes. And this is an opportunity to see a sampling of what our Zoom class looks like. Prior to class, it's a great opportunity to come together in our gallery mode here and to chat with each other and also to check in with the nurses. And then after we start class, we do a very gentle warm up. Then we do some aerobic exercise and some weight resistive exercises, some stretching and relaxation at the end. So I will go ahead and show you snippets of those features of the class. Let's find our pause. Let's get ready, get set, start. Deep breath in. And out. Again, bringing it to the side stretch here. Abs are in. Back to the back. Arms up. Crossing in front. Ah, let's walk. Nice full spine. Don't forget to breathe. So we're breathing in, breathe out. Single row, arm row and triceps kick back. Abs are in. We'll finish the class with a few minutes of relaxation. Closing your eyes, relaxing in the chair. Hi everyone, HeartFit. Membership at HeartFit for Life is evolving. Of the current 164 people attending, approximately 60% are either online or doing a hybrid approach, and about 40% come exclusively on site. When analyzing the 40 new people who have started this year as of July 1st, the percentage is essentially flipped. Still, we are capturing 23% who could not attend in person, and 15% are benefiting from both. So both services are needed. Our in-person classes adapt to each person's ability. However, this was more challenging online and required us to develop more diverse online classes to provide access to a wider range of abilities and limitations such as seated chair aerobics, chair yoga meditation, stretch strength balance, and standing aerobics. The referral process is straightforward. We either get a fax referral or the patient calls us and we initiate the process. A referral form is completed and medical records are requested. Stanford's new referral process has increased the number of referrals to HeartFit for Life significantly. The MD referral form is also available on our website. The initial valuation fee is $225 and the monthly fee is $165. Scholarship funding is, uh, is available. Overcoming barriers to cardiac rehab at HeartFit for Life. I find the main one to be patient perceived need. We analyzed a sampling of the first quarter referrals in 2022. 76% did not start. And of that 76%, about 50% are either unresponsive or have declined. And essentially, a lot of times they think, say, I can do it myself. So even though the referral has been made, they are still not starting. Stronger, unequivocal messaging from all healthcare providers is needed. Cardiac rehab saves lives. It is part of your plan of care along with your medicines. It is a standard of care. Costs can be a concern for some people, although we try to price the program at a reasonable monthly fee. Insurance doesn't cover HeartFit for Life. However, the copay at other programs can exceed our monthly fee. Scholarship funding is offered and fees are kept low with the support of annual fundraising and grants. Transportation, distance, and timing are sometimes barriers, although our new online program has helped mitigate these barriers. Language barrier, always an ongoing challenge. We do have some bilingual nurses and members and we have used Google Translator to help with this. Healthcare provider awareness. 
Ongoing messaging is conveyed with our very supportive medical advisory board, healthcare professional mailings and emails, a new healthcare professional packet we send out, new healthcare professional visit orientation uh, Zoom uh, meetings, and open houses on Zoom. Medical issues can preclude participation, although in some instances, the online program has helped. Benefits of continued participation. Historically, many cardiac rehab programs allowed for long-term participation. Although for some of the Bay Area programs, space is limited, and this is no longer an option. Continued participation helps augment and or maintain behavioral changes. At HeartFit for Life, approximately 50% of new members come for one year, and over 35% continue long-term. The average length of attendance is 6.5 years. One of our members wrote, today is the day after my 88th birthday. I am celebrating, among other things, the fact that I'm fit and healthy. How did this happen? Well, I think there are two reasons. First, my body's become a kind of showcase for the latest medical devices. Second, for the past 25 years, I've belonged to a cardiac rehab program. Patients continuing, uh, or patients who continue greater than three months at our program, um, they do so because HeartFit for Life provides the discipline of attending a regular class, having that accountability, the camaraderie, which it provides a circle of support and in so many ways um, reduces social isolation. Many appreciate the ongoing medical supervision and early identification of problems. Ongoing education helps with motivation to stay on track. They feel better and stronger. Essentially, HeartFit for Life is a home for longevity. In summary, going to a brick and mortar program, although the gold standard is not always accessible, and now we have broadened our capability to reach more individuals who can benefit from this life-saving program. Thank you to all of you who are giving unequivocal messages to your patients, referring your patients, and problem solving with your patients to overcome barriers to participation in cardiac rehab. Thank you. Thank you, Robin and Julie and Jonathan. I'm gonna ask um, if Jonathan can turn on his camera as well. We have um, several questions in the chat for both of you. Um, I don't think we'll have time for all of them. So perhaps after um, we ask a few, you could go ahead and address them in the chat. But um, to start off with Robin, there are several questions about um, HeartFit for Life. Uh, one, one comment was that the delay from referral to participation is uh, related to the, there are specific orders that need to be processed by a physician for exercise that are paper-based, or then there is a pre-authorization process and those steps can take quite some time. Um, do Jonathan or you have any suggestions on how to mitigate that issue? Hmm. Dr. Robin. Well, one of the things that uh, I, I have to say that the referral process is streamlined significantly when Stanford has uh, automated the referrals. And one of the things that we're employing at, at, at our program is our administrator will um, call the patient and uh, many times we may not hear from them for whatever, an extended period of time. And we'll, we're, I'm now, and we'll do, two or three phone calls from the administrator. Now we're trying to pilot where I'm doing the second phone call if we haven't heard from that person in a week from the RN perspective and to kind of um, make more of an impact in that regard to convey more of the benefits of, of cardiac rehab. It's just that strong unequivocal messaging. Uh, and and the, there are questions about the median age group for the virtual Zoom participants at HeartFit for Life, as well as is this a service that can be utilized uh, from out of state? Yes and yes. They, well, the average age is 74 in our program. And the um, we do have people from out of state attending the program now. And this has been a big push of ours is to be able to reach people who don't have access to brick and mortar programs 
in their respective areas. So we definitely have people that are coming out of state now. Exciting, it's very exciting. It is. Um, and then there are actually more questions in the chat. Uh, Jonathan, if you can briefly uh, answer, uh, there was a, oh, I think you must've already done it in the chat about what a program uh, entails. But what we'll do is we will move on. Can't hear you, Dr. Kondawal. Oh, oops, yep. I got, I got muted. Um, I, I think what we'll do in the interest of time is to ask both of you to please answer some of more of those questions that are in the chat for you. And I will invite Nikki Brown, Molly Wainstock, uh, Vijaya Parameswaran, and Dr. Valley Hoover to uh, turn on their cameras who are in the next uh, panel uh, discussion. Uh, I think, you know, we are going to talk more about the various components of what actually happens in cardiac rehab. And so we are going to start off with Nikki Brown, who is an exercise physiologist at Stanford Healthcare Valley Care. She is passionate about helping patients build strength, stamina, and confidence after a cardiac event, and is working to support wellness in her patient populations with smoking cessation uh, resources, as well as emotional support needs. She'll be followed by Molly Weinstock, who is also an exercise physiologist with 10 years of experience. She is the current president of the California Society for Cardiac Rehabilitation and works as supervisor of the cardiac cardiac rehab and wellness services at Marin Health. Um, Molly was recently designated as a fellow of AACVPR and her favorite part of working in the field is developing connections with patients and helping them achieve lifelong healthy habits. After her, we will welcome Vijaya Parameshwaran, who is a dietitian and a diabetes educator with extensive experience in devising lifestyle interventions to improve cardiovascular health. She's a clinician at our Stanford South Asian Translational Heart Initiative, also known as SATI. She is a PhD student at Case Western Reserve University, and her research interests include digital health technologies and the role of lifestyle behaviors in chronic disease management. And Dr. Valerie Hoover will conclude the panel. She is a cardiac psychologist and adjunct clinical instructor at Stanford in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Her areas of expertise include assessment and treatment of medical trauma, PTSD, depression, health anxiety, and psychological factors interacting with cardiac diagnosis and treatment. So with that, I will ask uh, Nikki to start us off and, um, and we can proceed accordingly. Okay, just pulling up my slides here. All right. Uh, does that look okay, Dr. Kendall? It looks great. Great. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I am very happy to be here with you all this morning, and I'm honored to be surrounded by so many substantial speakers in today's conference. I've heard so many great talks already this morning. Um, as Dr. Kendall mentioned, my name is Alyssa Brown. Most people know me as Nikki. I'm the lead exercise physiologist at Stanford Healthcare Tri-Valley in Livermore, uh, working in the outpatient cardiac rehab department. Um, I've been here since about 2015. Uh, today, I'll just be giving a brief talk about the ITP and cardiac rehab. Uh, for those of you listening that already work in the field or have worked in the field in the past, there won't be too much new or revolutionary information in this presentation. But for those of you who are here to learn more about cardiac rehab, it is my hope that you will get something out of this presentation. I have no disclosures. So the learning objectives of today's talk are going to be to explain the components of cardiac rehab, including cardiac rehab program structure and function, and to explain what an ITP is and how it's used in cardiac rehab. So as most of you know, there are several components involved in a cardiac rehab program. A large component is going to be the exercise training, which involves helping patients to begin and then maintain a safe, personalized exercise plan that includes cardiovascular exercise, as well as some weightlifting and flexibility training as well. There is also baseline and ongoing assessment of personal risk factors for heart disease, including monitoring of blood pressure, uh, lipids and cholesterol, diabetes numbers, as well as stress. I'm going to stop you for one second, Nikki. It seems like your slides aren't advancing. Oh, shoot. Okay. 
Um, it should be the cardiac rehab component slide. Um, let me see if I can pull them up. Is this better? Now I can see your cardiac rehab component slide. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Medicare and most private insurance covers 36 sessions. Uh, exercise sessions typically are one to three times a week. We encourage almost all of our patients to attend three times a week if possible. Uh, sessions consist of blood pressure checks, telemetry monitoring, exercise. Your voice is fro frozen up, Elisa. We'll give her a minute and see if. To explain that patient's journey and the progress in the program. Cardiac rehab staff and the medical director should be able to read this document and understand how the patient is doing in the program, what the goals are and what the plan is going forwards. The ITP can come in different formats, depending on the needs and structure of each program. In our program at Stanford Tri-Valley, we use an electronic ITP, uh, utilizing EPIC that we can easily and quickly send off to our medical director to sign from his own office. Other programs might use a paper ITP and, um, and or an ITP template that is included in their telemetry software. There are four general components or themes that should be included in an ITP. The ITP must have an exercise prescription component that shows that the physician approves and that the exercise prescription is appropriate and individualized to the patient. The ITP must include education, counseling, and behavioral interventions for cardiac risk factor modification. It should include an evaluation of mental and emotional functioning, as well as pre and post assessments based on patient centered outcomes. The ITP is a document that outlines the proposed goals, plans, and methods of rehab tailored to each individual patient. The ITP must contain four domains. For each domain, there is a need to assess and establish goals, interventions, and education needs. Uh, for the exercise domain, this includes both home-based and center-based exercise prescription. We must create goals when a patient starts the program and then revisit the goals throughout. These will be in terms of increasing exercise duration, frequency, and intensity. You want to ask if they're progressing or what education has the patient been given on exercise. For the nutrition domain, we'll be assessing items such as weight, BMI, current diet habits, in our program, we use a survey called Rate My Plate. The other surveys are out there as well for outcome measurements. Goals may be related to meeting with a dietitian or losing, gaining weight, reducing salt intake. You might ask if the patient has been referred to a dietitian or attended a lecture on heart healthy diet. Have they been given education on weight loss strategies, food labels, the effect of alcohol on the heart or the impact of obesity on heart health? For the psychosocial domain, goals might be related to stages of change, um, survey assessment. We use the HAD survey, hospital and anxiety depression scale and stress reduction. Interventions could be teaching of breathing and meditation techniques for stress reduction. There might be a referral to chair yoga or a support group, or in some cases, a referral to case management or psychologists, depending on what resources the hospital offers and as well as education on stress as a risk factor for heart disease. Other risk factors will be assessed depending on what the patient needs. Um, sometimes um, we'll get patients coming through that are active smokers, although it's few in the Bay Area, but when they do, it's gonna be a huge focus for us to get these patients to quit. Uh, patients also often need help with medication compliance or monitoring blood pressure. I've included a couple screenshots of our ITP that we use in Epic. 
Um, this, these images just show a few sections of our ITP that include exercise, nutrition, and tobacco. Uh, but we also have sections for medication compliance, blood pressure management, psychosocial management, diabetes, and heart failure. Um, in addition to just clicking the buttons, it's important to include some free text in your ITP as well to really be able to tell the story for each patient. Uh, this flow sheet will get converted into a note where we can include more information on the patient, such as medical history and a medication list, and can free type more details about each patient as well. Okay. So that concludes my talk on the ITP. I'm going to hand it over to Molly Wainstock for her talk. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, let me just share my slides here. Can you hear me okay? I can. Great. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So um, I'm going to kind of supplement Nikki's talk. Um, by talking about how cardiac rehab is utilized, what kind of utilization there is as far as how many patients have actually participate in cardiac rehab. And then I'll talk a little bit about advocacy. Um, so let's advance here. I don't have any disclosures. Um, so as Nikki just discussed, the core components of cardiac rehab are supervised exercise training, educational skills and skills development, uh, psychosocial counseling, and of course there are many benefits to patients, um, including reduced risk of mortality and secondary events such as another heart attack, um, better medication adherence, improved um, exercise performance, better understanding of the heart's function, um, and even improved mood and sense of well-being. There are also benefits um, to the hospital that's providing um, cardiac rehab or the clinic that's providing cardiac rehab, um, such as improved quality of care um, and outcomes. Of course, um, as us that work in cardiac rehab know, our patients tend to come out of cardiac rehab pretty happy um, with the care they received. Um, it's of course individualized to each person. So they um, tend to really appreciate, you know, the program that we're providing to them. Um, and then they often relay that information to their physicians who in turn, um, uh, refer more patients over to cardiac rehab, as well as um, relaying that information to hospital administration. Um, this uh, reduced admission rates um, also improves the quality of care and the metrics that the hospital receives um, from the patients that go through our program. This graphic is um, from the Take Heart Initiative, uh, which is championed by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. The goal of Take Heart is to increase the usage of cardiac rehab from the current 20 to 30% to approximately 70%. So um, they have a big task ahead of them, um, but I'll talk a little bit more about this and how, um, how they're looking to improve how cardiac rehab is used. Um, every year, there are about 800,000 heart attacks in the US. Um, and there are fewer than 10,000 cardiac rehab programs in the country. So um, you can imagine um, the very few patients get referred and those that do get referred, sometimes they have to wait um, to see a cardiac rehab program because there's just no room for them. Um, move on here. Um, like I said, currently about 20 to 30% of eligible patients participate in a cardiac rehab program. Um, that means that even if they've had a life-threatening cardiac event, there was some sort of barrier that inhibited their participation in cardiac rehab. Another program that aims to increase the use of cardiac rehab is called the Million Hearts Campaign, which is championed by the CDC. The goal of the Million Hearts campaign is to improve cardiac rehab utilization from the current 20% to 70% of, of eligible patients. Million Hearts wants to eliminate as many barriers as possible to participation 
One of those barriers can be lack of diversity. There's um, lack of diversity among patients and among cardiac rehab staff. Um, you can see here on this graphic that um, out of over 600,000 Medicare patients, 19.6% of those who participated in cardiac rehab were white, while only 7.8% were black. Similarly, 29% of people in the US um, are in a minority population, and there are only 4% of uh, minority cardiac rehab professionals. So that's a huge um, difference there. Um, there tend to be fewer cardiac rehab locations in neighborhoods that are low income and in rural communities. Um, there are a lot of critical access hospitals in rural communities, and they have um, oftentimes fairly low budgets for their cardiac rehab programs. They have small spaces and a lot of patients to see. So we know that cardiac rehab works. Um, as Nikki just described, um, the outcomes speak for themselves. Patients lose weight. They improve in their functional capacity. They're able to perform their ADLs with more ease. Um, diabetic patients improve their glucose tolerance and their mortality improves. Um, even like I said, their sense of well-being improves. They're able to chat with people that have been through um, very similar situations, life altering events. Um, and that certainly improves um, their lives in general, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this graphic is, again, from the Million Hearts campaign. As you can see here, um, those that, that attended all 36 cardiac rehab sessions, which is the standard number of sessions approved by insurance, there is 47, a 47% lower risk of death and a 31% lower risk of a heart attack um, than those who attended only one session. So you can see there's a clear dose response relationship in cardiac rehab. Essentially more sessions completed leads to better outcomes. So uh, why isn't it being utilized? There are several barriers to patients um, receiving the referral to cardiac rehab. First and foremost is a lack of physician support, or maybe they um, just don't even know about cardiac rehab. They don't know, they haven't visited their local cardiac rehab, the, the facility in their hospital, um, and they're just not aware of you know, what happens. So I encourage you, um, if you are a physician or you work outside of cardiac rehab to go visit um, your cardiac rehab, chat with the staff, ask them questions. Um, and if you do work in a cardiac rehab, invite your, um, your physician team to see um, what you have going on. Um, I've had patients tell me that their cardiologist refused to write a referral um, because they thought the patients didn't need it. And I think that comes from lack of knowledge. Um, they just haven't, they haven't seen what we do. Uh, there needs to be better standardized education for physicians on the outcomes of cardiac rehab for their patients. Um, and like I said before, happy patients go back to their doctors and they um, tell them the benefits that they saw firsthand in their cardiac rehab program. So um, encourage your patients to tell um, their physicians about their experience in cardiac rehab. Um, another barrier is long waiting lists in places that there were um, a large amount of physician support, but few cardiac rehab programs to meet the need, there's going to be uh, waiting lists that sometimes are months long. And we prefer to get, uh, especially our surgical patients, open heart surgery, we prefer to get them in within five to six, no more than eight weeks. And sometimes it's not possible. We do see the most benefit um, when we start them around that six to eight week mark. So um, if we're having them wait three, four months, we might not see as much benefit. And then um, if they're starting an exercise program on their own, which we prefer that they come into cardiac rehab before doing that, um, they might not see the need if they're having to wait a few months. And lastly, some, um, some programs don't have an automatic or Girl in place. They, um, there are some hospitals and clinics that have begun an automatic referral process uh, for any patient that has a qualifying diagnosis. In some cases, that referral will either get set to, sent to the program's work queue if they're on EPIC, 
or their EMR automatically, or they can receive it by fax. Um, that way, you know that your patients, anyone that's getting discharged from the hospital with a qualifying diagnosis, they are going to get that referral. So I think uh, Jonathan showed this graphic as well. Um, this is a description of uh, where the cardiac rehab programs are in relation to the population in that area. So um, another barrier to, uh, let's see here. Uh, another barrier to patients starting cardiac rehab is time commitment. Uh, typically a patient's insurance will approve them for 36 visits. Um, uh, which will have them uh, doing cardiac rehab three times a week for about 12 weeks. Some patients hear this and think that they can't possibly commit to that amount of time, which then is up to the program staff to convince them that it will help their heart to heal. Um, uh, sorry, I just lost my place here. Um, again, like I said, long waiting list, the patient is most um, motivated to enroll in a cardiac rehab program. Um, more immediately after their event um, because they're um, essentially fearful if they have something that's been, um, you know, a life altering event. So if, um, if they are uh, being referred quickly and are able to get enrolled quickly into the cardiac rehab program, they're more, more likely to both enroll and to stick it out through the whole program. Um, and lastly is the, car the concept of cardiac rehab deserts, which is a really important concept. Um, on this graphic here at the bottom, you can see um, the colors on the map represent the number of cardiac rehab programs per 100,000 US adults. In the West here and in the South, you can see there's a lot of kind of gray area where there's not uh, very few programs related to how many people live in the area and people that qualify for cardiac rehab. Um, I'm up here in California um, in the Bay Area and we, um, my program is the only program in Marin County. So we have just a huge amount of referrals and a very small space. So we do have quite a bit of a waiting list, unfortunately, and we try to do the best we can to get in the patients uh, with the most need for cardiac rehab, but um, you know, we're in an impossible situation. We have so many referrals, a lot of physician support, and um, lots of patients to see, and a lot of programs in, um, in the West and in the South, like Florida, have that issue. Um, the Midwest has a lot of cardiac rehab programs for their population. They have a lot of adequate coverage. Um, this means that people are uh, either uh, too far from cardiac rehab to get care or they have, have to travel a great distance if they're in a cardiac rehab desert. That can be an added stressor. We do have some patients at my program that travel um, sometimes one to two hours to get to our program. And of course, if you have ever been to the Bay, Bay Area, we have a lot of traffic and that's an added stressor when patients are coming into our cardiac rehab program. So what are we doing to improve cardiac rehab update, uh, uptake? I know that Karen Louie talked about this a little bit. Um, during, the, during the current public health emergency, virtual cardiac rehab is covered by insurance and some programs are offering this. I think there's um, one program uh, at Marshall Healthcare Center that um, does offer cardiac rehab but they're still kind of few and far between. Um, essentially a virtual cardiac rehab has many of the same components such as exercise and education. However, there does need to be real-time video as we saw in the last uh, presentation with the patient during their exercise rather than having them on a portable telemetry monitor that we use during a traditional session. Uh, this is currently approved through the end of 2023. Um, but it's imperative that we advocate for continued coverage um, so we can continue to reach people without um, adequate access to cardiac rehab, especially those people in rural and low income communities that um, either have to travel a long way or they just don't have access at all. 
the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab, ACDPR, is advocating for a couple of bills in Congress when, that will allow non-physician practitioners, such as MPs and PAs, to prescribe and supervise cardiac rehab, and the other that will improve uh, reimbursement for off-hospital campus clinics. Um, so more clinics can be built um, that aren't directly associated with the hospital. Currently, if a cardiac rehab program is outside of the hospital, including the one that I run, um, they get about 20 to 30% of the reimbursement that in-hospital programs do. Eliminating this barrier would um, allow for more clinics to be built outside the hospital walls, which will improve access to services. And lastly, the Million Hearts and Take Heart campaigns continue their work in improving cardiac rehab utilization and referrals. These are my sources. Um, I believe um, this presentation will be sent out later on. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Vijaya next. Thank you. Um, thank you, Molly. And it's an honor to uh, be a part of this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Kandarval, Jonathan, and the team for um, such an invigorating conversation and an opportunity to participate and learn in transforming cardiac rehab. Uh, my conversation today is going to be around um, nutrition. Um, as I start, um, I wanted to take the opportunity to um, are you, is everybody able to see my slides? Yes. And is it still working? Are you still seeing the present review? I am, but we'll see when you move forward if they progress okay. as well. So, um, you know, I don't think anyone in this room today needs to be convinced about the role of nutrition in cardiovascular uh, disease prevention. Um, I think it's very well established in literature as well. Uh, many of you might have seen the uh, recent publication in Lancet. I think it was May 2022. That was a long-term secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease randomized controlled trial um, that compared the Mediterranean diet and a low-fat diet and showed the Mediterranean diet to be superior uh, in uh, preventing cardiovascular events. Um, Yet, you know, as I was trying to anchor nutrition in, cardiovascular, in, in cardiac rehab, um, I was looking at what is present in the literature in terms of e effectiveness, as well as how nutrition intervention is reported. And um, it was uh, very disconcerting to see that um, there's very little out there in terms of what is published in terms of nutrition effectiveness, as well as uh, nutrition interventions for cardiac rehab. And clearly, because um, I can understand there are a lot of barriers uh, in, in, in implementing a really good nutrition intervention program. Um, but unless we collect um, uh, data, unless we monitor intake, unless we um, make sure that um, everything uh, that we are trying to do with nutrition is being monitored and followed, there really will not be a way for us to learn from our uh, from these interventions, right? What was sobering was that there were only 11 um, randomized control trials in a systematic review that looked at um, nutrition effectiveness and intervention uh, that had some sort of, some sort of a nutrition um, intervention uh, that was tracked. And the most common nutrition interventions that were tracked or the most common uh, strategies were around uh, decreasing uh, caloric intake and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, low fat, if you will, or calorie to fat ratio was monitored, but there was no other intervention that was really monitored or recorded. So that's the premise yeah. of our conversation today. And let's start by understanding, sorry, was there a comment? Okay, I'll keep going. So th that was kind of the premise of my, my um, talk today. And um, I didn't necessarily show any slides as I set my premise. Um, I'm happy to share the references of the two uh, studies that I uh, talked about um, 
uh, in, in the chat later on. Uh, so what is our goal today, right? Our goal is um, to not only understand rehabilitation, but also to make sure that um, we provide therapy. Um, and what is the difference between rehabilitation and therapy? Rehabilitation, um, according to Miriam Vipster, is to bring you back to your former capacity. Therapy is to uh, relieve and also heal a disorder. So how do we make sure that nutrition is an integral part of rehabilitation, but also towards therapy? And one of the way I see this difference is that when nutrition and education is focused towards rehabilitation, it's mostly focused on do's and don'ts. I saw a conversation in the chat about using the plate method, and I think it's a fantastic visual. It's a great visual. It's a great self-assessment tool. However, uh, it doesn't take you beyond beyond um, the pictorial view of what your plate needs to look like. When we talk about cardiovascular prevention, we now, based on the um, evidence and literature, uh, know the role of dietary fiber, know the role of sodium, know the role of saturated fat. And all of these nuances are missed when we uh, use the plate method. But I, I would definitely start there, but then take it beyond. So in my mind, I would think about difference between rehabilitation and therapy is to kind of start with the visual, but also take it farther, personalize it based on the patient's preferences and needs, and then really start focusing on monitoring, get a baseline, and then take it to a better desired state. Um, some of the things that I would talk, you know, focus on in terms of the therapy is to really focus on the cutoffs. Um, and here I would talk about, you know, saturated fat, uh, main, making sure that the overall saturated fat intake is under 10%. Again, this is geared towards therapy, not just rehabilitation, but towards therapy, getting them to a better state. Um, Sodium intake, um, as you may all know that the average sodium intake, uh, the American diet is north of 3,400 milligrams. Our goal is to keep it under two grams or 2,000 milligrams. Um, tough job, uh, but definitely having a dietitian in your cardiac rehabilitation team uh, can facilitate that. So sodium is an important aspect of that of your conversation. Uh, potassium, you know, towards lowering blood pressure. Dietary fiber, um, greater than 30, greater than or equal to 30 grams per day, again, is a, is a feat if you think about what the average intake of fiber in the American diet is, which is about 15 grams, um, and then alcohol. So these are like the important cornerstones in a dietary intervention program um, as you focus on cardiac rehabilitation, but also cardiovascular disease um, prevention. Um, I think the other really important aspect of uh, therapy needs to be uh, focusing on calorie deficit. And uh, when I talked about the randomized control trials, you know, out of the 11, about five of them did have some form of energy reduction, total estimated energy intake, you know, things like that. Um, focusing on calorie deficit, in my mind, in our practice at the Sati Clinic and in the other practices that I have worked appears to have a better um, a rate of, of weight loss. So you focus on how many calories the, uh, the patient or the um, uh, you know, the person who is ill uh, needs to decrease. Uh, so that kind of really helps in anchoring um, the weight loss focus if it is necessary. Um, there are a lot of uh, digital technologies that are available to monitor food intake. Um, so in my previous slide, when I talked about focusing on food frequency and understanding what the patient's intake is, by no means um, do we need to go back to the days of a clipboard and start checking mark, you know, check marking, if you will, what the patient's eating. There are phenomenal uh, apps like the chronometer, which is one of my favorite, and a lot of my colleagues at Stanford use. Um, my Fitness Pal is another uh, great app. Um, and I think cardiac rehabilitation programs are a fantastic venue where you get the opportunity to see the patient over a few days where you can start, you know, establish a baseline and put together goals that they can um, improve as they go along. So you can iterate therapy. Um, in addition to setting a calorie deficit, in addition to setting nutrition and nutrition goals um, and monitoring, I would say that focusing on meal patterns and food preferences, so it's individualized, uh, I think will uh, um, give you the opportunity of a better adherence, better compliance, and also more joy and happiness from the patient, right? So the number of meals, understanding how many meals do they eat? And is it, um, 
needed for them to change the number of meals that they, they are eating, uh, understanding their snacking, understanding when do they eat meals. Um, so these are some things that uh, dietitians and car cardiac rehabilitation programs are also very skilled in doing. So making sure that you have um, a team of dietitians or a dietitian who formulates these things in your cardiac rehab program is another way that you can transform um, cardiac rehabilitation from rehabilitation to therapy. Um, the best way for me to convince all of you about the role of nutrition um, is by talking about food, right? So I wanna put, shine the spotlight, if you will, on dietary fiber today. Um, I think if everyone here is convinced about the role of fiber, is enticed in trying something new in their diet in terms of improving their fiber intake, I think then it will automatically extend to patients. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about um, gut health today. And um, my focus is mainly around the role of processed foods and uh, the role of incorporating dietary fiber. So, um, the most important aspect that I want to highlight here is the role of unprocessed foods. Um, so here, this is actually a visual uh, by uh, Erica Sonnenberg, our physician here at Stanford, who did a fantastic study, a few of them, if you will, on gut diversity um, and inflammation. And um, here in this visual, she talks about the role of uh, unprocessed foods like broccoli, for example, which are really integral in improving uh, microbial diversity in your gut because they are only broken down much later in your gut and released as short chain fatty acids, which um, improve blood glucose um, control and uh, improve satiety, improve metabolism and uh, control inflammation. On the other hand, processed foods, um, ultra processed foods, uh, for example, they um, a breakdown and uh, integrate into your into our circulatory system uh, much early on, and um, these uh, are one of the ways one of the ways where um, the diversity of our of our microbiome is compromised and um, increases the risk of insulin resistance, metabolic uh, dysfunction, as well as you know increases inflammation. Um, this is another um, study that I will leave uh, if you will. I have the reference here, but I can also share it on the chat later on. Um, uh, the study was called fee fi -Fo, uh, by uh, Dr. Sonnenberg and uh, Dr. Gardner here. Uh, they compared uh, fermented foods and uh, high fiber foods. And again, the goal was to improve gut diver microbial diversity in the gut and lower inflammation. And what they found was the response to high fiber foods um, definitely improved nutrient profile. And here they looked at um, inflammation, they looked at inflammatory markers, they looked at uh, tri you know, uh, lipid markers, looked at blood glucose control, Control. And so definitely high fiber foods um, improve nutrient profile, uh, but the response to inflammation was individualized. Um, on the other hand, fermented foods consistently lowered inflammation and consistently improved microbial diversity. So, so the take home with this distinction here is that um, even if the response to fiber is individualized, um, if fiber intake is low and you want to increase or encourage fiber intake, it may be because uh, many of your patients, many of you may not tolerate fiber. So the best way to improve your tolerance for fiber is to really start with fermented foods and gradually increase your weight towards increasing fiber. And uh, the response to fiber is individualized is definitely a physiological response. So if you feel like you don't tolerate it, it's unlikely that you're imagining it. And starting with fermented foods may be a better option. Um, I often get asked about the role of probiotics in, um, in, this, uh, in improving microbial diversity, in controlling inflammation. And in the study that, again, Dr. Sonnenberg uh, did, they found that uh, they called it the Project Probiotic Study, and they found that probiotic supplements did not, um, in fact, uh, improve inflammation and did not microbial diversity. Um, in regards to fermented foods, I, I introduced that to what are fermented foods really. Um, you know, this uh, fermentation, as many of you would know, is an age-old process. Um, uh, countries in Asia, Africa have used fermentation as a way of preservation. Um, it is really a way for microorganisms to kind of break down the anti-nutrients in foods, phytates, for example, which are anti-nutrients, and they break them down, they break down the uh, in, in the indigestible or undigestible um, uh, carbohydrates and starch and uh, make them more bioavailable. Um, breaking down of these, um, these anti-nutrients um, 
also is one of the ways that fermented foods are easier for us to digest and therefore consuming fermented beans, legumes, tempeh. Um, these are some great ways that you can not only encourage fiber consumption, not only maintain or get towards that therapy uh, goals that you've been looking for for your patients and for yourself, but also um, uh, eat something that's delicious, that has a much more rich uh, you know, and complex flavor profile. Um, here are some examples of fermented foods. Um, this, I think, is a great tool um, for your patients as well. Uh, allows them to experiment with some new, unique foods that they might have not, have not tried. Um, yogurt and kefir, for example, and those of your patients who do not tolerate dairy, um, it's worth, to, worth it to kind of ask if they tolerate it or not, if they've tried it or not, because um, kefir, for example, is 99% lactose-free. So if it's lactose intolerant induced dairy intolerance, they may be able to tolerate this, right? And um, depending on where you live, uh, here in California, we have access to um, all types of ethnic cuisines, um, as well as um, you know fermented grains like tempeh, fermented chickpeas. Um, so th these are some really unique ways, and there are a, a plethora of YouTube videos these days that give you tools uh, that gives you strategies on how to ferment foods. Um, lastly, here are some examples of high fiber foods. Um, again, just like we talk about um, vegetables and we talk about thinking color, when you use plate as an example and you talk about you know, color and visuals, um, I like to think about lentils and beans also in, from, in, the, in the terms of colors. I mean, look at how many beautiful different varieties we have, right? So um, going beyond wheat, uh, going beyond rice, um, choosing whole intact grains, choosing pulses, that, pulses, lentils, and beans that are beyond what you're usually um, used to eating, um, like horse gram, garbanzo. Um, if, you're not, if these are not available in your mainstream stores, they may be available in your ethnic stores. If they're not available there, Amazon these days has access to uh, many of these um, you know, uh, unique um, or uh, mainstream uh, grains, if you will. Um, lastly, I would say that uh, as I conclude, um, tubers and squashes, uh, there's a lot of confusion on uh, whether these are carbohydrates and are these carbohydrates good for me. Um, I would definitely focus on these uh, because they are a form of complex carbohydrates. They, are, uh, they play a big role in improving your microbial diversity and uh, they are delicious. So as I conclude, I don't have a conclusion slide, but I just want to um, leave you with uh, food for thought here, which is to focus on um, foods like um, fermented foods and high fiber foods. Uh, think about ways that you can um, utilize your dietitian in your cardiac rehabilitation program. Um, do your best to monitor, focus on therapy that incorporates not just saturated fat and, and uh, caloric uh, intake, but also fiber intake, sodium and alcohol. And um, uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'm handing off to Dr. Valerie Hoover. Okay, thank you, Vijaya. Um, it was a really fascinating, interesting talk. I enjoyed that. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Okay, so hopefully you can see those now. Um, okay, so I'm very excited to be here today. I'm going to be speaking about psychological considerations and opportunities within cardiac rehab. And given the limited time that I have, I'll be focusing on the key research findings on depression, psychosocial stress, and CB risk, as well as recommendations for screening and intervention in cardiac rehab. So estimates vary quite a bit, but um, approximately one in five cardiac rehab patients will present um, to cardiac rehab with moderate levels of depression. And we know that depression after a cardiac event is uh, associated with worse outcomes, um, including depression after an acute coronary, after acute coronary syndrome, uh, being a risk factor for both all cause and cardiac mortality, as well as non-fatal cardiac events. So there's real risk associated with depression. And it's um, the, the evidence on the research on mechanisms is um, 
actively being conducted. And um, it, it seems certainly that both direct and indirect mechanisms are at play there. So based on the prevalence of depression and the consequences of depression in this population, the AHA has recommended that the following steps should be taken. So they recommended that all patients with CHD be screened for depression. And I'll, I'll talk about depression screening in just a moment. They also recommended that patients who screen positive for depression should be referred for treatment. And that might include things like antidepressant medication or a type of evidence-based psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, which I'll also talk more about later. Um, as well as physical exercise as patients would receive in um, or participate in in cardiac rehab. So this is the PHQ-2, which may be familiar to some of you. This is a screener for depression that focuses on the two cri uh, key criteria and symptoms in depression, reduced interest or ability to, to derive pleasure from usual activities and a, a down or low mood. Um, and it assesses these symptoms over the past two weeks. If patients score three or greater on this measure, that would be an indication that you want to follow up with more in-depth screening using something like a PHQ-9, as you see here. And so the PHQ-9, um, in addition to those two key criterion questions, assesses other symptoms of depression, including cognitive symptoms, emotional symptoms, somatic symptoms of depression. And um, this is uh, both of these items are, are self-report, so patients can complete them on their own, and then you would then score them. You can see the score ranges on the right-hand side. Typically, a score of 10 or above is an indication that the, there's some kind of significant um, depressive process that's occurring, and they would, the patient would benefit from a referral to an appropriate healthcare professional for further assessment, treatment. Um, I do wanna note though that regardless of the score that they obtain, you'll see question nine on the bottom of the PHQ um, asks about thoughts of suicidality essentially. And so of course, if patients are endorsing any kind of thoughts of suicide, you, you would wanna follow that up as well. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I did wanna make sure to include it in the slides, which you'll receive after um, the event today. So this is a flow chart. Um, this came from the AHA guidelines that were published on screening for depression. And I think it's just a really nice visual of how to screen for depression, what measures to use, and how to follow up and, and what to do based on how patients respond. Okay. So... Next, I wanted to share the results from a meta-analysis that included 20 randomized controlled trials and controlled cohort studies that looked at the additional effects of a psychological intervention compared to exercise-based cardiac rehab as a standalone. And there was a good bit of variability in the types of psycho psychological interventions that were included in these different studies. Um, but they all had to have an evidence base. Um, some focused on distress management, others more on social support or improving coping responses, relaxation training, and different types of behavioral interventions. Overall, they found that the addition of a psychological intervention uh, was associated with a trend towards greater reductions in depressive symptoms, as well as reduced cardiac morbidity. So it seems to be helpful for addressing both the uh, mental health piece of this, as well as how that mental health piece is impacting their physical functioning and cardiac functioning. However, just a kind of a caveat here. So the, there was a lot of heterogeneity in the, in kind of the methodologies of the different studies that were included. In this analysis. So for example, on the low end, um, patients received only one hour of active psychological intervention, all the way up to 100 hours. And similarly, study duration on the low end was one month, on the high end, follow-up of five years, right? So a lot of variability makes it a little difficult to draw conclusions. So for that reason, I did want to drill in to one of the more robust high quality studies that was included in this analysis. 
So this is a study called um, the Enhanced Trial. This was led by James Blumenthal and his colleagues at Duke. It included 151 patients with CHD who were randomized to one of two treatment groups for a period of 12 weeks. And those groups were either standalone cardiac rehab or cardiac rehab plus a stress, uh, stress management training, SMT. And then both of these randomized groups were later compared to a non-randomized age and sex matched no CR group. So these folks got no CR, no stress management training. Okay, so I wanted to describe the interventions of just a bit. So the cardiac rehab intervention uh, participants, participa uh, patients participated in aerobic exercise for three times per week for about 35 minutes. They received education about CHD, nutritional counseling based on AHA guidelines, and two classes devoted to the role of stress in CHD. And then patients randomized to the cardiac rehab plus stress management training group received the identical cardiac rehab intervention plus this stress management training. So the stress management training was based on principles of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And CBT is a type of psychotherapy that is evidence-based for the treatment of a number of different mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety disorders, and some others. And at its core, it looks at the connection between how we perceive events. So that would occur in the form of thoughts or belief systems so how we perceive events, how we respond to those events. And for you know, just about all of us, it's gonna be some mix of adaptive and maladaptive responses. So how we perceive an event, how we respond to an event behaviorally, how both of those things impact our emotional experience of the event. And um, it also recognizes that we can't directly impact that emotional piece. We can't force ourselves to feel or not feel something. What we do have more ability to influence or those other components, how we're thinking about something um, and what we do. And so that's where, uh, that, that's kind of the underlying uh, focus um, and foundation for CBT. So this intervention was delivered over 12 weeks. It was 1.5 hours per week uh, in a group. I think there were about four to eight participants per group. And uh, patients learned um, many different types of skills, including how to reduce demands to reduce stress. So for example, how to better prioritize, how to identify their personal values, which can then inform how they prioritize, time management, problem solving strategies. It also included training in cognitive restructuring, which is essentially what I was describing earlier. So it's this process of uh, identifying, you know, what did it, how are we actually perceiving something? How are we thinking about it? What do we believe to be true? How accurate is that really? How helpful is that? Um, and then kind of arriving at a perception that is more balanced and a better reflection of how things actually are more helpful. Uh, patients also were trained in more effective techniques um, and strategies for communication and relaxation training. For example, something called progressive muscle relaxation. I think they also taught patients visual imagery. So when they looked at the effects of um, kind of how patients in each of these three groups fared at the end of the intervention in terms of composite stress measures. Maybe not too surprisingly, they found that folks who received the um, CR plus stress management training showed greater reductions in anxiety, global distress, perceived stress compared to both the cardiac rehab alone and no CR groups. In addition, the researchers also looked at uh, treatment group and rates of clinical events over five, that five-year follow-up period. So I'll just orient you to this um, figure here. So along the bottom, we have year, the follow-up year, so follow-up year one, two, et cetera. 
And then on the left, we have percent free from clinical events. So how to interpret that would be um, at one at the top here, that would mean nobody had a clinical event at that time point. Um, and at zero, it would mean everybody had a clinical event, okay? And then this bolded line on top is gonna be our cardiac rehab plus stress management training group in the middle. We have the cardiac rehab uh, alone group. And then on the bottom, no cardiac rehab, no stress management training, no intervention. And um, what they found is that, as you can kind of you know, surmise from the figure here, so patients who received either of the interventions um, fared better in terms of having fewer clinical events over follow-up compared to getting nothing. And they also found that patients who received um, cardiac rehab plus this robust stress management training um, had significantly fewer cardiac events compared to cardiac rehab alone. So in conclusion, we know that depression, psychological distress are prevalent in patients presenting to cardiac rehab and are associated with greater morbidity and mortality. Um, AHA has recommended that patients be routinely screened for depression using at a minimum the PHQ-9, I'm sorry, PHQ-2. Um, and then patients who screen positive for depression should be referred, treated, which may include things like antidepressant medication, psychotherapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy and physical exercise as with cardiac rehab. And then lastly, there's evidence that including a robust CBT-based stress management intervention in cardiac rehab may improve not only psychosocial distress, but also cardiac outcomes in these patients. So that's all I have. Um, I, I know I was kind of trying to cover a lot and there's a lot I didn't get to talk about today as well. So if you have any questions about um, you know, opportunities to, for psychology and screening in your rehab, uh, we'd welcome you to reach out or post a question. Thank you. Dr. Hoover, that was as per usual, amazing. And I want to um, thank the entire panel for a very informative talk about what the benefits of the pleiotropic benefits, I'd like to say of cardiac rehab are. Um, I know that we are running a little bit over on time, but there are quite a few um, questions in the chat. And I would like the panelists to, if they're able to turn on their video for one question and one comment is, um, you know, Throughout both of the last sessions, we've heard about some of the importance of providers' recommendation and engagement in referral for patients to see the true benefit for them. Um, what I can tell you is hearing that cardiologists don't see the benefit is very upsetting to me because one of the things that I tell my patients is, you know, if you can't take this time to invest in your health, then what are we doing here? because it's, you know, the time that they put in is directly as to what they're gonna get back. I do think with some of these newer models of care delivery, we can make uh, the impact to their day-to-day -the -day a little bit more appropriate, but it's really, you know, I know everyone can exercise on their own, but it's really understanding all of these other services that come with attendance that we really have to reinforce. But um, that being said, uh, from the chat, there were a, a couple questions about, you know, when should these patients be referred to advanced level of psycho psych uh, psychiatric evaluation and, and care, whether, you know, we should be using a PHQ score of five or 10, and then if so, who makes the referral? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I appreciate the question. So um, the the standard recommendation is that, you know, if a patient has a PHQ of 10 or higher, um, you know, that, that that would trigger a referral. Um, you know, if, so a, a PHQ of, of between five and nine would typically indicate a more mild level of depression, in which case, especially if there's no indication of suicide risk or suicidal ideation, it would, it would be very appropriate to just monitor the patient, continue to readminister the measure and keep an eye on how their symptoms are 
um, evolving over time. Um, I think it can also be a conversation with the patient. So, you know, even if the patient is experiencing a more mild level of depression, um, you know, they may, they may desire to, um, you know, talk with the mental health professional um, and, and pursue care. So I think it can be a conversation for sure. Thank you. Oh, and, and sorry. And uh, I, the second part of that was who makes the referral for depression. Um, so I, I mean, I suppose it, so I, I, uh, I'm a cardiac psychologist, but I'm not embedded in a cardiac rehab, but, um, you know, I would imagine, you know, different insurance companies have different, um, requirements for where that referral needs to come from, but likely if it can be the same person who's doing the screening to kind of have that continuity, I think that would probably be ideal. Thank you. And, um, Vijaya, there are several questions about diet in, in the chat. Um, you know, does home cooking count as processed food cooked versus raw broccoli was one example. And there's a couple others about a ketogenic diet. Could you maybe, um, give us a couple comments on that? Yeah, I was just typing. Thank you, Dr. Kondo. Well, I was just typing a response to Deborah about um, cooking. So I will answer that on the chat and I have a long answer type there. Um, the, the idea is to limit ultra processed foods if you're focusing on improving microbial diversity because of the benefits improving microbial diversity has on you know lowering inflammation and you know, that's the way to go. Cooking is a form of processing, but the idea with cooking is to kind of mostly break down anti-nutrients, which are phytates. Think of phytates uh, as things that plants have in order to protect them from the environment, right? So it's the plant's protection mechanism. And humans um, don't break down phytates. So cooking um, enables uh, utilization of the uh, nutrients in the plant um, because the phytates are broken down. And I will answer the question on, on ketogenic diet, Dr. Kandelwal, in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, I think since we're um, definitely over, maybe what we'll do is have, have you all please just look through the chat and answer um, the questions for you. Um, right now it is 12 o'clock. We were scheduled to come back um, from lunch at 1210. However, I think you know, I would still like to be able to let everyone have a chance to get up, stretch, eat some food, as well as to participate in Jonathan's moderated uh, session during lunch. So perhaps what we could do is agree to meet back at 1215, which would give us like a 15 minute quick snack and stretching of the legs. And, um, and then we can try to uh, get back on time in the afternoon session. So um, I will see you all back in about 15 minutes.